Today, we will look at a set of some of my favorite interview questions. The questions are as follows. Where could you find the following circuit? Why is C1 adjustable? What is the low and high frequency gain of the circuit? In this video, I will answer each question, starting by solving simpler cases and then working my way up to this final circuit. Let's start by ignoring the capacitors and trying to solve for the gain of the following circuit. Let's assume that you forgot the voltage divider equation. We can rederive it. Using Ohm's law, the total current in the circuit is V in divided by the sum of R1 and R2. Again, using Ohm's law, the voltage drop across R2 is the current through R2 times the resistance of R2. Combining these two equations, we get that V out is V in times R2 over R1 plus R2. Plotting this transfer function over frequency, we can see that we have a constant attenuation over all frequencies. When R1 is 9 mega ohms and R2 is 1 mega ohms, there's minus 20 dB of gain, or in other words, 10x attenuation. If V in is 1 volt, V out would be 10 times lower at 100 millivolts. In simple terms, the larger R1 is compared to R2, the more attenuation there is. Now, let's ignore the resistors and do the same calculation for the circuit with just capacitors. We can use the same voltage divider equation as earlier, but instead of pure resistances, we use complex impedances. Here, Z1 is 1 over SC1, and Z2 is 1 over SC2. Plugging into our voltage divider equation, we get the following result. We can use algebra to simplify, yielding V out equals V in times C1 over C1 plus C2. Again, we can plot this over frequency and see that the gain is again frequency independent. However, compared to the earlier equation using just resistors, having a larger C2 compared to C1 will cause more attenuation. Now let's introduce one of the capacitors into the standard resistive divider. We can use our voltage divider equation a third time, where Z1 is R1, and Z2 is the parallel combination of R2 and C1. Simplifying Z2 gives R2 over SC1 R2 plus 1. After plugging in Z1 and Z2 to the voltage divider equation, and then simplifying, we get that V out equals V in times R2 over SC1 R1 R2 plus R1 plus R2. Now we have some frequency dependent gain. When we plot the gain, we can see that we have constant attenuation at low frequencies, and then a first order roll off at high frequencies. The larger C1 is, the lower the cutoff frequency. Finally, let's look at the original circuit with all the elements in it. We use the voltage divider equation one last time, this time with Z1 being the parallel combination of R1 and C1, and Z2 being the parallel combination of R2 and C2. Following the algebra, we get the final result of V out equals V in times SC1 R1 R2 plus R2 all over SR1 R2 times C1 plus C2 plus R1 plus R2. Notice what happens when we set S equals 0. We get the same gain as we did when we had just the resistors. This makes sense as at low frequencies, the capacitors have a very high impedance compared to the resistors so the parallel combination can be approximated as just the resistance. Likewise, for S approaching infinity, now we are left with the gain we got for the purely capacitive circuit. This time, the capacitor impedances are very small compared to the resistor impedances, therefore the parallel impedance is approximately the capacitor impedance. In simple terms, at low frequencies, the resistor values set the gain, and at high frequencies, the capacitor values set the gain. If the attenuation factors are mismatched, there is shelf filter behavior, where there are different gains for high and low frequency. But if the attenuation factors are matched, the attenuation is again constant over frequency. Why is this attenuation being constant over frequency important? Well, imagine you are measuring a signal and you want to plot its value over time. 
If the measurement circuit attenuates high frequencies, you are not recording the true content of your signal. If all frequencies are attenuated the same, you can apply a simple gain to the output to reconstruct the original signal. If you didn't guess it yet, this signal is a simplified view of a passive 10x oscilloscope probe. Now you may ask, why even have the capacitors in the first place? If you had just the resistors, there is no high frequency roll-off. While this is true, the capacitance C2 is something inherent to the oscilloscope front end. No matter what, there is always some parasitic capacitance to ground at the input of the oscilloscope. C1 is an intentionally placed variable capacitor that allows the user to tune the probe's frequency response. And if C1 is tuned correctly, C2 no longer causes high frequency roll off. Now you may ask, why even have the resistors? The answer to that is that the low frequency impedance of the capacitors can be hard to control and can even become resistive at very low frequencies. Resistors at low to medium frequencies tend to be relatively ideal, that is, they have a constant real impedance versus frequency curve. Therefore, it's best to let the resistors dominate the low frequency end of the frequency response. So, to reiterate, the circuit produces constant gain at high and low frequencies, C1 is adjustable to cancel out any variation in C2, to produce a constant attenuation ratio over a large frequency range. This is commonly referred to as scope probe compensation. This circuit can be found in a 10x passive oscilloscope probe. Note that some probes may have C2 as the variable capacitor, but the idea is the same. In the description, I have linked a good follow-up video on how to compensate a scope probe. It also shows the time domain view of the signal when the compensation is incorrectly set. Thank you for watching.